Well, welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. For those of you who perhaps never listen to our shows, uh, they run every third Friday of the month from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, we're both licensed medical herbalists who trained in England and graduated there with a degree in herbal medicine. We run a clinic in Garberville where we consult with clients about a wide range of conditions and recommend herbal supplements and dietary advice. This month we want to reassess the role of sugar in the diet and why good sugars are essential for good health. It seems that many things we are told are bad for us are actually the good guys and we need to see the facts and research that's out there. First it was saturated animal fats and we were told they were hardening our arteries and leading us into an early grave. Well, not true. The polyunsaturated uh, alternatives are actually damaging us and are the cause of many disorders. Then salt, which we were told was increasing our blood pressure again, not true. Salt's essential and regulates many processes without which we suffer from increased adrenaline and stress hormones. Now sugar, it's the bad guy. Well, not true. So once again, we're excited to have Dr. Ray Pete with us this month and we'll be hearing from him on research-based facts behind the statement that sugar's good for you. So, Dr. Pete, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, would you first give the listeners who perhaps have just tuned in and maybe never listened to the show or never heard you on our shows before uh, a little bit about your background? Okay. Um, in the 50s and 60s, I was, I was studying and teaching in the humanities, but I spent a lot of time reading at the uh, science library of the University of Oregon, and so uh, I eventually decided to get a PhD in, in biology, physiology, uh, so I could use their laboratory equipment as well as their library. Um, but uh, I never really uh, considered myself part of the, the um, academic scientific community. I just uh, uh, got what I could from their, their culture. And... Uh, have have tried to uh, see things that are useful um, rather than um, uh, just abstract, uh, and that has meant that I concentrate on small molecules rather than uh, genes and uh, uh, the big fancy molecules. Uh, so water, carbon dioxide, salt, calcium, sugar, and fats have been the things that I study most. Okay, well, perhaps, uh, Dr. Pete, would you first qualify the term uh, good sugar for our listeners, and then we'll get into the uh, facts and uh, figures, as it were, surrounding sugar and why they're so important for us? Um, uh, well, uh, sugar is um, really the ideal uh, energy exchange substance, uh, it's it's useful for all organisms practically, and um, it's um, something that we can uh, store and uh, uh, turn it into uh, use it at, for building all of the big molecules. And it, it, uh, when it's metabolized, it releases uh, carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is really a more universal substance than oxygen for the support of life. Um, Mike, you had told us in one of our previous shows that there are organisms who can uh, live without oxygen, known as anaerobic organisms, but there are no organisms that can live without carbon dioxide. Right. And uh, uh, it turns out that... Uh, it isn't just mosquitoes and, and fleas and bed bugs that are attracted to carbon dioxide, but uh, the uh, flatworms and uh, nematodes and such that they're, they're studying as uh, simple models of metabolism and aging, they uh, seek out a fairly high concentration of carbon dioxide as, as uh, more favorable for their living conditions. So as our cells use uh, sugar more effectively, then are we producing a larger amount of carbon dioxide? Uh, yeah, and when we produce more carbon dioxide, that means we inhibit the production of lactic acid, which is not only a wasteful way 
to use sugar, but lactic acid uh, has, has a signal function that uh, turns on uh, a whole range of inflammatory uh, processes. And uh, uh, they, they have talked for decades about uh, tumors producing lactic acid, but lactic acid also promotes tumors uh, and, and all of the inflammatory processes. So uh, you want your sugar to metabolize into carbon dioxide, which will then uh, prevent the, the dangerous overproduction of, of lactic acid. And can somebody overdose themselves on lactic acid from eating fermented cultured products? Um, yeah, I got interested in that uh, a long time ago when I, I found a, a nice kefir product that tasted good, and I would drink a pint of it for lunch. And um, I came down with a migraine every time I did that, and uh, that caused me to, to read more about uh, the um, metabolism of, of lactic acid. Uh, it is normally produced by by stress uh, when you uh, use your muscles faster than your lungs can uh, can keep the oxygen supply adequate. The lactic acid uh, is uh, circulated into your bloodstream, reaches the liver, and your liver has to spend extra energy to turn the lactic acid back into glucose which it then sends back to the muscles. But meanwhile, it's depleting your liver of any stored glycogen it had uh, just to get rid of the lactic acid and turn it back into glucose. So, so it's wasting the sugar that your liver has stored as glycogen. Yeah, and uh, I happened, because I probably was hypothyroid, I happened to be so sensitive that I got a migraine just from uh, drinking a, a package of the kefir. Because the lactic acid was um, actually lowering your blood sugar then. Yeah, and uh, since then I've run into quite a few people who were having uh, various symptoms every time they ate a fermented product with lactic acid in it. Uh, the vinegar type fermentation is it's slightly toxic, but it, uh, it doesn't doesn't participate in that blood sugar disturbing effect that lactic acid does. Right, so it's all the probiotic. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, the some of the uh, probiotic bacteria that make lactic acid in themselves, uh, they can produce other substances that are protective, but you don't want them uh, producing uh, lactic acid from the sugar you eat. Uh, the sugar you eat should be um, absorbed up in the, the first part of your intestine where there are no bacteria to speak of. Or there shouldn't be, right? Yeah. And um, for various reasons, uh, sometimes the, the bacteria will migrate up there um, from a sluggish bowel and so on. Uh, or if you eat uh, poorly uh, digested materials like too many starches or... Uh, uh, fibrous mixtures <clears throat> of starch and carbohydrates, uh, these things will uh, not be absorbed, and so they'll go down and feed the bacteria, and then the bacteria can make lactic acid and other worse toxins from them. Okay, I think it's uh, important that um, <clears throat> a, a few moments ago you mentioned the fact that glycogen that's normally stored in the liver as a storage form of sugar is used... Uh, to convert lactic acid when it's been produced in the absence of sufficient oxygen from muscular activity to create uh, the conversion of uh, lactic acid back into glucose. And what I wanted to um, just bring out is that for most people that are listening, perhaps you may not understand it, but that the liver is a good storage organ for glycogen as a form of sugar to be used in times when it's needed. But would you um, expand on that in terms of how much how much uh, glycogen is the liver able to store? How long do people have? Before they have to, or how long can people go with just eating proteins or 
not eating before their liver goes, okay, I don't have enough, and then they start eating this, themselves. This brings out why sugar is big. It will start to bring out why sugar is good, and then we can keep delving into the uh, into the details and the facts. Um, if your thyroid and other hormones are uh, in the right uh, concentration, your liver should be able to store at least eight hours of uh, glycogen so that uh, everyone should be able to get through the night uh, on the amount of glycogen in their liver without um, resorting to other sources of energy. But when your thyroid is a little low or, uh, for example, if your estrogen is too high or uh, other things are interfering, then your liver uh, sometimes can hardly store any glycogen. And uh, typically, uh, when your glycogen uh, runs out, you um, uh, send out a surge of adrenaline, which will squeeze the last little bit of, of glucose out of your liver. It activates the, the dissolution of, of glycogen, turning it into glucose. And when your uh, liver can't respond to the adrenaline anymore, uh, the, the uh, the first sign of, of depleted glucose is uh, you might feel shaky and and cold from the high adrenaline. Then you resort to increased cortisol, which begins breaking down your tissues, uh, turning protein into uh, fat and carbohydrate for energy. And uh, under that extreme condition when when you've been out of uh, glycogen long enough to um, run on uh, cortisol for uh, oh, about a day, uh, your thymus will will be dissolved just in a few hours of of the intense uh, exposure to cortisol. And uh, when the the quickly dissolved tissues such as the thymus are gone. Um, over the next uh, week or whatever it is that you're uh, not replenishing your sugar, your muscles will atrophy so that um, people who fast for a week or two uh, will usually lose more muscle weight than they lose fat because of the very rapid conversion of, of protein into fuel. Under the influence of the cortisol. Yeah. Um, so um, whenever you eat a, a big dose of, of protein without sugar to back it up, um, you're going to stimulate the secretion of, of first insulin to dispose of the digested amino acids from the protein. And the insulin, which properly disposes of the amino acids, is going to lower uh, any uh, circulating glucose and uh, tend to turn it into fat. And as the glucose goes down, uh, that will drive up your cortisol. So typically a big uh, protein meal will cause a huge surge of cortisol. And uh, some people become uh, supposedly diabetic or very hyperglycemic. Uh, because they eat uh, too much meat unaccompanied by sugar or some carbohydrate. And that's just because the, the protein is stimulating the cortisol and the cortisol is... Yeah, it's doing its job of um, turning protein into sugar and fat. So it's important to keep a balance between proteins and sugars. and. You should always eat sugars with protein. Right, and yeah. just for our listeners to clarify, sugars, carbohydrates, we're using the term uh, synonymously. They're, sugars and carbohydrates are basically the same thing. There's different types of sugars or different types of carbohydrates, starchy carbohydrates versus non-starchy carbohydrates, and I think we're going to get into that a little bit later. But um, Okay, well, you're listening to uh, Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. And from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in 
with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's topic of sugar and the benefits of sugar. Uh, the number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. And we are excited and very pleased to have with us on the show today Dr. Ray Peat, uh, endocrinologist and research scientist, who is going to unravel some of the some of the myths and some of the uh, truths uh, about why sugar is good for you. So, um, Dr. Pete, perhaps we should break into the uh, good sugars uh, versus the bad sugars because obviously some, most people <coughs> have heard are in one form or another that sugar is bad for you. Uh, so let's clarify the bad sugars versus the good sugars and uh, what they are and what food sources they are in. Um, one of the things that uh, started me thinking about uh, whether a person should uh, follow the government's advice to eat a lot of starch. Uh, complex, otherwise known as complex carbohydrates. <laughs> yeah, uh, the government and the American Dietetics Association, uh, I think it's been almost 50 years, uh, have been promoting that idea that complex carbohydrates have some advantage over sugars and I started reading about that in the 70s and uh, ran across Gerhardt Folkheimer's research in which he had uh, first fed uh, different uh, mixtures of starch and water, uh, corn starch, potato starch, and uh, several other kinds of starch, uh, which occur in grains that are roughly the size of a cell, anywhere from uh, 5 microns in diameter up to 100 microns, and he would feed these to his experimental mice and then uh, sample their body fluids, and uh, uh, he found that a chronic diet uh, was of um, a frequent feedings of, of the starch solution was, um, he, he could demonstrate the, um, the particles of starch in their bloodstream just minutes after they ate it, and then in all of their body fluids uh, about an hour later. And uh, so he, he uh, fed that sort of a program to his mice for several months and found that they were prematurely aged. And when he sliced them up, he found in all of their organs uh, little nests of dead cells where uh, one of these fairly large grains of starch, roughly the size of a red blood cell, was stuck in an arteriole, uh, killing all of the cells in, downstream from that pl plugged up point. So the starch granules were blocking the arteries and the starving arterioles. the cells, or and, the arterioles, and starving the cells of the nutrition from the blood. Yeah, and huh. uh, so he tested it on his medical students and uh, would draw blood uh, and uh, sample their urine and uh, found that about 30 minutes after you drink some of it, you can find starch grains in your veins. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour later, you find it in the uh, urine and in the bile and even in the cerebrospinal fluid about an hour and a half later. <laughs> and and they, they're not supposed to cross the blood-brain barrier, are they? <laughs> well, they aren't supposed to cross the intestinal barrier, yeah, <laughs> barrier. <laughs> but, uh, because uh, they're so small? I mean, they, is this just... This is, so large. is this because people's intestines are completely out of balance, or is it just well, um, that nature of uh, the size of the starch granule? Uh, he, he assumed and proposed that, that they're being forced between cells, but uh, people have uh, such a mechanical conception of of how the wall of the intestine and the arteries and veins and capillaries, how they're constructed, that uh, it, it just seems mechanically impossible, but uh, it, it, it's actually uh, more like a, a, a viscous fluid, and uh, things can uh, really sort of migrate through things as if there was uh, no absolute barrier. So it's like a mesh. Yeah. Um, many years ago, someone made a movie of, of white blood cells and uh, showed them wh 
what looked like uh, freely swimming in and out of cells, uh, uh, swimming into a cell and uh, looking around behind the nucleus and poking around and then leaving the cell. <laughs> As the guards of the blood? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, people don't uh, draw conclusions from that, that uh, there aren't cell walls that have to be broken. It, it's, it's more like a, a sort of viscous fluid. Through which every, all these communications occur. Yeah. Okay, so let's list the uh, uh, good, good sugars and and then the bad sugars just mm-hmm. to keep that in context. Well, so Doctor Pete's already mentioned the starches mm-hmm. as being the bad guys because they're blocking right. arteries, but there's other things that starches do that aren't so great for your. Um, yeah, the the typical starch when it's cooked and and digested. Um, if it isn't digested, then it goes down and feeds the bacteria. And that's a really bad effect. Uh, they've seen with uh, these so-called uh, prebiotic or probiotic uh, semi-digestible starches that are being promoted. They have found that the uh, poorly digested starches cause behavioral changes in their animals, makes them anxious and aggressive. Uh, to have stuff fermenting in their intestine. Uh, and uh, some of the products of, of um, bacterial action on these undigested materials uh, can tremendously increase endotoxins uh, and cause inflammation of the intestine, liver, and eventually all of the body. Uh, but uh, the typical well-cooked starch, when it is digested, releases pure glucose and uh, in my first physiology lab professor had us feed I think it was a, a 10 gram dose of cornstarch to the lab rats and uh, she said wait 10 minutes and then operate on the rat and see how far this huge glob of starch paste had migrated and uh It turned out that there was no trace of any uh, starch paste left in the rat after 10 minutes. Well, it was all picked up. It it had just instantly been turned into glucose and and absorbed. And we aren't quite as fast as rats, but uh, uh, when you look at the the so-called glycemic index of foods, uh, starch tends to be near the top. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, very similar to pure glucose, mm-hmm. and that means that you get a a quick, powerful stimulation of insulin when you eat starch or plain glucose, and that the insulin uh, does its work quickly of disposing of the glucose by turning it into fat when you absorb more than you need. But then your liver is, if it's turned into fat, then it didn't really store very much in your liver, right? Yeah, it does that too. But when you have this uh, very intense dose, uh, some of it goes into the liver, but uh, if it can't all uh, momentarily be disposed of in the liver, then some of it turns into fat. So uh, even though you aren't eating too many calories, if you eat it in the form of very quickly digested starch or pure glucose, you'll get these bursts of fat synthesis and uh, uh, tend to get fatter and fatter. And because the uh, the same thing that happens with a quickly assimilated glucose or starch, uh, the same thing happens as when you eat a, a pure protein meal. The sudden falling of the blood sugar causes a, a surge of cortisol production and uh, then that changes your metabolism, uh, makes you waste protein. Even if you didn't eat any, you'll, you'll then disturb some of your tissue, uh, your thymus and muscles especially. And uh, so you, the cortisol helps to direct the fat deposition to your waist area and and back and face as in Cushing syndrome or the the, the so-called metabolic syndrome. 
So whether you eat a meal that has pure protein or whether you eat a meal with protein and starch, the end game is going to be the same. It's going to drive up insulin. It's going to drive uh, increased fat production. <clears throat> and it's not going to be storing sugar in your liver as effectively as it could be if you were eating a different type of sugar. Yeah. So what types of sugars are slow release and are stored in your liver as glycogen so that your body can have an instant supply of sugar? Uh, sucrose, glucose, fructose, and lactose are very good, uh, well-metabolized sugars. And do those sugars feed bacteria in the lower... Um, uh, well, they're so quickly absorbed that uh, usually they will be absorbed uh, in partly in your stomach and partly in the first foot or so of intestine. And uh, the presence of fructose uh, partly blocks the release of insulin and partly changes the effect of insulin so that it, it helps to... Um, uh, direct uh, some of the glucose into the liver while blocking its uh, its uh, storage as fat. And uh, so you get a, a lower uh, secretion of insulin, a, a lower stress effect, and a better uh, glycogen storage effect from either sucrose or the mixture of glucose and fructose, or in the case of milk and milk sugar, uh, the the presence of of the proteins and fat in the milk uh, add to the uh, slowing of the uh, the sugar effect. I wonder how um, many grams of sugar uh, would you say would be a good healthy amount? Because I know definitely with uh, Things like calories, they're pretty well under understated by government standards, as are several other levels of certain nutrients, etc. But what do you, what would you say for as an intake of sugar would be a good healthy intake? Well, it depends on your total caloric requirement, right. and uh, right. some, uh, especially hypothyroid women, uh, can maintain their their body weight on seven or eight hundred calories a day. And textbooks used to say that. You had to lose weight if you ate less than 1,600 calories a day, but now many people, especially uh, women, can get fat on 1,500 calories because of mm -hmm. things interfering with their uh, metabolism and, and thyroid function. But uh, if, if you have a healthy metabolism and can burn between 2,000 and 3,500 calories a day, then your um, carbohydrate requirement is going to be somewhere in the range of 180 grams to uh, 350 grams. And just to give <clears throat> people a, an idea of how many grams of sugar are in different foods, um, one teaspoon of sugar contains four grams of sugar. So it's it's actually not very much. You might think one teaspoon of sugar has a lot. And if you need 180 minimum per day to keep your liver happy, uh, to, in comparison, um, one good. cup of brown it's rice contains 41 grams of sugar. But the glycemic index of the rice is going to be a lot higher than it is of the sugar. And so you'll store the the sugars from the rice a lot more as fat than you would as if you were eating the same amount of grams of sugar in actual white sugar. And when you get your uh, sugars in the form of, of more natural foods rather than uh, refined uh, white sucrose, for example, if you uh, eat um, orange juice and milk, um, the orange juice is extremely rich in minerals compared to rice or or any of the uh, popular uh, pasta, bread, and so on. Uh, those are very poor in in the minerals that that orange juice and other fruits provide richly. And potassium, which is uh, very abundant in all fruits, 
acts like insulin, so you don't have to secrete very much insulin uh, for the same dip- disposition of, of uh, glucose. And, and the orange juice also has uh, some other helpful chem- chemicals like naringin and naringin and that uh, help to prevent inflammation and increase the, the good disposition of, of the carbohydrate. And in milk, besides the protein and fat, uh, slower, slowing the absorption of, of the lactose, uh, the calcium is um, besides the potassium and and other minerals, the calcium powerfully stimulates the um, energy metabolism, uh, causing you to to use your uh, sugar more quickly, preventing it uh, from being stored as fat. Uh, so the milk drinkers, uh, in general, tend to be much slimmer than non-milk drinkers, largely because of this effect of calcium. So there's more than just cal- uh, insulin to the way you store sugar, but um, potassium and calcium have an effect on your use and storage mm-hmm. of sugar as well. Okay, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. And from right now until the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's topic of sugar and the benefits of sugar. The number, if you live in the area... 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. Okay, so to continue uh, with the, uh, the, good, the good benefits of sugar and why, uh, and why it's so maligned. Well, so Dr. Pete, can you explain to us, like, so you've mentioned milk and orange juice as being uh, good sources of some natural sugars. Um, what about honey and, and lots of other fruits? Um, honey is um, generally better than white sugar because it has some minerals, but not as much as in the fruits. Um, and uh, it's probably the uh, the, the best um, refined. Uh, the bees refined it uh, rather than than a factory. But um, uh, honey has been used as a, a food by all of the high civilizations. Uh, I think there's good reason to think that that uh, sugar uh, goes with uh, high cultural development. Uh, the Egyptians and Chinese and uh, uh, all of the old, well-developed cultures uh, knew about honey, and uh, uh, most of them also refined uh, sugar. The, the Arabs were the pioneers, uh, the Egyptians. Uh, we're actually refining uh, sugar from sugar cane uh, probably a couple thousand years ago. Hmm. Okay, sorry. Do we have a caller? No. I was just wondering if you guys were hearing me on that. On no. that call or not. It was getting... Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but well, we hear you now, Marianne. Thank you. Okay, so going on to... Um, um, uh, previous cultural experience with sugar, uh, the Egyptians and other civilizations have certainly uh, ben- benefited from sugar and held it in high regard like they did salt uh, as a form of currency for trading uh, with neighboring civilizations. So the uh, the current dogma of um, sugar being the bad guy and being responsible for cavities and increasing diabetes and uh, obesity uh, can this pretty much be explained from the processed, refined sugar that we're looking at, talking about tonight with things like uh, pastas and white bread and those other sources of instant release high glycemic index sugars versus... Uh, and, l- and low mineral sugars. And low mineral sugars, yeah. Uh, versus sugars that uh, come with, with a complement of other uh, minerals and other uh, c- chemicals uh, Things like honey and then the fruits. Are there, are there any other, any other sources uh, that people should be aware of that are certainly going to encourage people to use rather than tell them they shouldn't be using sugar? I think you've about covered it all, um, yeah. Andrew. Okay. Is that, do you have any more sugars to add to the list, Dr. Pete, that you'd <laughs> say are the good guys? Um, no, nothing occurs to me. 
Okay. So, how about the, uh, you know, for people that are listening now, how, what's the, uh, what, what's the deal with diabetes and sugar? And, um, and, and that link, and, and how that link is not necessarily true? Um, the, um, principle in physiology that I think really explains it, uh, was proposed a few decades ago. Um, it's called the Randall effect or the Randall cycle, although there's no cycle involved. Uh, it, that refers to the fact that free fatty acids, uh, block the use of, of glucose by cells. And, uh, that was demonstrated frequently in hospitals when they were giving, um, nutrition, uh, support to, uh, people who couldn't eat or cancer patients who were losing weight very fast in the form of, of a soy oil emulsion. Gosh. Um, they saw that about 15 minutes after injecting, uh, this nutritional, uh, dose of, of, uh, emulsified soy oil intravenously that people would uh, get hyperglycemic. And, uh, the Randall effect, uh, is sort of an instantaneous thing, but when the, uh, fatty acids that are involved in blocking the use of sugar, when those are polyunsaturated, uh, they produce long range damage that keeps the Randall effect going, keeps blocking the use of sugar. Um, uh, a group, I think it was in South Carolina, uh, the, the lead author of one of the papers was, uh, MX Fu, uh, who showed that, uh, the, uh, glycated proteins that are seen in, in diabetic people, um, uh, that uh, glycated hemoglobin, for example, and they, they blame that on, on glucose or fructose fragments sticking to, to hemoglobin and other proteins. But, uh, Fu and his group, uh, demonstrated that polyunsaturated fatty acids are much more powerful, uh, glycators, mm. uh, sticking fragments, uh, uh, three carbon, five carbon, uh, and longer fragments uh, from the uh, spontaneously oxidized polyunsaturated fats stick to the proteins. And uh, so the, the free fatty acids not only block the sugar use instantaneously, but they produce these uh, uh, advanced uh, glycation end products, the AGEs, uh, that are associated with diabetes and aging. Um, so the the chronic effect of of um, a high fat diet, if the fat, if the fat diet is predominantly unsaturated, uh, produces not only diabetes but all of the uh, things that result from glycated proteins. So in diabetes, people are um, poisoning their pancreas with these uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids blocking the pancreatic beta cells from producing insulin but then they're also um, they have these high levels of free fatty acids that are blocking the sugar getting into the cell and then doesn't that feed back to the system to tell the yeah, body raise the blood yeah, sugar higher a, we're not getting enough it's a self-stimulating system so when you, you when you block the cells from using uh, glucose they call for more glucose and the liver obliges by uh, uh, making uh, extra glucose when it can, uh, mobilizing it. And going back to the starches, starches you've already described more strongly stimulate insulin than the simple sugars do that come from fruits and honey. So yeah. wouldn't that wear, be more contributory to the theory of wearing out the pancreas? Um, yeah, and the um, uh, diabetics... Uh, supposedly the, the sugar just isn't getting into their cells, but uh, what's happening, you can see in the fact that diabetics often have very high lactic acid uh, concentrations, uh, showing that the, the glucose is getting into the cell, but it just can't be uh, used oxidatively because of the uh, fatty acids blocking the 
the respiratory system. So then the lactic acid goes to the liver, which turns it into more glucose. I wanted to ask you in a little while, because um, we have a caller on the line, about uh, your opinion of high fructose corn syrup. But uh, let's take this caller first. Are you on the air? Hello? Hello, you're on the air. Hi. I'm wondering, um, because some of the stuff I understand, some of the stuff I don't understand. Um, okay, so if I eat a big bowl of cereal with a lot of sugar, then two hours later I get sleepy, what does that mean? Um, usually, um, it's... It's the same effect that um, a person who has been hypothyroid experiences when they correct their thyroid. Uh, when when your um, adrenaline is high, you um, are uh, you're, you're being stimulated. You're very uh, alert and aware and yeah. on edge. Your body's under the stress hormone adrenaline. It's ready to go, and you feel a wide awake. And when you either uh, correct your thyroid function or whatever other glandular process is, is causing you to have high adrenaline. Or if you eat a lot of sugar, uh, sugar and salt will um, both help to lower adrenaline. And so they can both uh, make you sleepy while, while they're present and circulating. So um, people who have insomnia uh, can uh, t- take care of the problem temporarily by uh, just taking some uh, sugary food and salty food at bedtime. Okay, let me ask you a question. If a person is diabetic or pre-diabetic, is there a simple way to express what the good sugars and bad sugars are? And I'll take my answer uh, off the phone. Thank you very much. Did you hear that question, Dr. Pete? Um, yeah. Um, it's a... Uh, Basically, the whole thing we're talking about, uh, uh, the, the the definition of diabetes and pre-diabetes, um, are, uh, they've been created to um, first to sell insulin and uh, then to, um, to, to sell the non-insulin uh, sugar-regulating reg- drugs and so on, and uh, they keep multiplying the definitions of of how many types of of mm-hmm. diabetes there are. There's type one and type two and and uh, syndrome X and gestational diabetes. Uh, we'll probably have half a dozen types of diabetes <laughs> if the, the government and the medical business uh, get their way off. Continue. <laughs> okay. Okay, but basically, um, the good types of sugars that are gonna uh, n- be more slow release are the fruit sugars and the honey. Um, and if yeah. they're eaten in combination with a uh, fat and a protein, then they're going to be even more slowly released and they won't require the pancreas to pump out a ton load of insulin. Yeah, fruits and cheese are, are very safe things for diabetics. And they'll notice, um, like we've seen with our diabetic clients, that their sugar numbers don't go up with fruits and cheese and milk and honey. Uh, yeah, that, uh, I wrote a newsletter about uh, a couple French and an English doctor 140 or 150 years ago who noticed exactly that same thing, but it didn't catch on with the medical <laughs> business. I know diabetics are told they need to eat complex carbohydrates, but when you actually look at the glycemic index of complex carbohydrates, they're much higher than what's in fruit and honey and white sugar, believe it or not. And since the government has been making these recommendations and people have been eating more of the starches Mm -hmm. and uh, polyunsaturated fats, uh, the incidence of so-called diabetes has increased tremendously. Mm -hmm. So for that diabetic caller or if you're calling about someone else, fruits, honey, and, and dairy products and mm-hmm. avoiding starchy carbohydrates, which I should qualify for our listeners are things like bread, pasta, cereals, grains, rice. All those are termed starchy carbohydrates. Okay. They not only have a high glycemic index, which means they shoot your sugar level up quickly, but they also have the potential to feed bacteria in your lower intestine, which causes all sorts of other problems, as maybe Dr. Pete will have time to explain. But I think we have another we have caller. Another caller yeah. 
Um, in, the long, in the long range, it's very important to avoid the polyunsaturated fats uh, for avoiding diabetes. Right. Oh, right, yes, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that for that other caller. Avoiding the vegetable oils, soy, canola, corn, safflower, sunflower, hemp seed, hemp seed fish, all those polyunsaturated omega-3 and 6 mm -hmm. especially. Okay, so there's another caller. Um, are you on the air? Yes, hello. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. So I was wondering, what about beans and whole grains, like whole grain, brown rice, that kind of thing? Because you mentioned rice. Or were you specifically talking about white rice or with the whole grains? Well, like the, quinoa, things like that, and beans. What about, and also, a lot of different diet, uh, nutritional people claim that there's a problem when you combine, like, fruits with proteins and they want you to separate them by a couple of hours, things like that. But what you're saying seems to contradict that theory. And, uh, so I was wondering, I was, um, I think it's good to precede a big protein meal by maybe 15 or 20 minutes with uh, fruits uh, so that you uh, get your liver uh, stocked with some uh, glycogen uh, so that you don't respond so violently when you eat a pure protein. And the um, whole grains and uh, 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 legumes are... Um, they have more nutrients, but only a small amount of um, of the minerals uh, compared to the fruits. And uh, the germs do contain some valuable nutrients, but they also contain enough of the polyunsaturated mm -hmm. fats in the germs uh, that uh, that was why the refining was invented by the Chinese several thousand years ago, because uh, they... Uh, they found that the the rancidity of the, of the uh, whole grains uh, damaged the the nutritional value. Oh, well, that's it. So then it sounds to me like you're saying that a person should a, a good diet would be mostly fruit and and then protein and then maybe some of the other stuff, but that's staying it. away from the polyunsaturated oils, and even the omega-3 oils that they keep telling you to to concentrate on? Um, yeah, their virtue is that they're a little less toxic in the sense of causing cancer than the omega-6, minus but um, they tend to break down faster even than the omega-6, minus and their main virtue therapeutically is as an anti-inflammatory agent, that's that's why they're uh, becoming popular for uh, arthritis and, and psoriasis. Um, but the uh, the way they're anti-inflammatory is that their breakdown products uh, interfere with the immune system and stop the inflammation in the short run. But in the long run, they're suppressing your immune system. And, is that uh, like cortisone or something? Yeah, very similar. Uh huh. So then, if you wanted to have, you should go to, you should stick with things like fish oil and stuff rather than the. Well, uh, the fish oil breaks down very easily too. So, uh, in the long range, uh, it it has its serious problems too. A better oh. solution would be to find out what's causing the inflammation in the first place. Is it a a thyroid deficiency? or another hormonal uh, imbalance that's causing your inflammation rather than taking fish oils to just block it because even radiation uh -huh. can... you ra They used to do radiation treatments to help people's right. rheumatoid arthritis because it was anti-inflammatory. Um, wow. Well, do you, do you and I guess that's your husband that practice together? Is yes, that right? my husband yes. and is Andrew and I'm Sarah. Yeah. Do you guys do, like, can someone come to you and get, like, an evaluation of their system so that you know where your deficiencies are? Yes, we do offer consultations, nutritional and herbal uh, consultations, and we will be giving our number out at the end of the show. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your thank call. You.
Okay, right. okay, I understand there's probably four or more callers on the line. So okay. Well, that we've lost a couple. They've dropped in oh, and okay. out, but we do have another caller on the line. Because it is uh, 7.53, so there's another caller. So you're on the air? Hello, me? Yeah, you're on the air. Ah, very good. Hi, Andrew and Sarah. This is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hello. Hi. So um, I have a question regarding uh, the role of uh, sugar... Uh, in uh, yeast infections and hmm. systemic fungal infections. And Good. if a person has a hmm. systemic fungal infection, whether they should be avoiding uh, all kinds of sugar. Um, in general, things like the yeast that um, cause both internal and external infections uh, love sugar, but uh, they're usually about once or twice a year someone turns up who has a, a very intense um, infestation with uh, yeast uh, even in their stomach and uh, when they eat sugar uh, they can actually get drunk from uh, the fermentation turning the sugar into alcohol but uh, that uh, getting drunk on sugar is about the worst uh, effect of of the uh, sugar metabolism by the yeast. And when you starve yeast, if you have it living in your intestine, and, and they're attracted to estrogen, uh, estradiol is, is a reproductive hormone for yeast as it is for humans. Um, if your estrogen is high, they tend to um, uh, congregate in any place that is uh, rich in estrogen. Um, if you starve those for um, sugar, they tend to become invasive and they put out uh, filaments, not like, like the mushroom type fungus, but uh, a filament long enough to penetrate through cells, uh, like fingers reaching through your intestine walls looking for sugar. And uh, that starvation condition is what can make them invade your tissues rather than just living free in your intestine. And uh, it's only when they invade your tissues that they can become deadly. And on your skin, um, low thyroid people often have high estrogen, and uh, that favors uh, uh, genital yeast infections um, and uh, correcting the thyroid and, and hormones is the basic thing. Uh, eating a, a diet that, that helps to regulate your hormones and topically uh, just dusting with uh, sulfur powder, flowers of sulfur or precipitated sulfur is a safe way to, to kill them on the surface. And it even works taking a pinch of it uh, orally will uh, suppress the um, fungal growth inside the intestine. Oh, great. Okay. So yeah. are, you, are you saying, Dr. Pete, that if someone does have an overgrowth of fun, uh, fungus in their intestines, that actually eating more sugar would feed the yeast and make them happier so they're less invasive and less deadly? Uh, yeah, actually. Uh, and what would you suggest be a, a, a treatment, a good treatment for, for, for that? Well, the carrot salad... Um, the um, carrot is indigestible, and you know how a, a stale carrot takes weeks and weeks before it, it molds or uh -huh. never rots, really. <laughs> that's true. And, uh, that, that's because it has antifungal, antibacterial chemicals in it because it lives in the ground. Okay. And uh, so if you grate a carrot and then put some uh, oil, olive oil or coconut oil, and vinegar... Uh, vinegar is a bacterial uh, chemical. The, the acetic acid is the bacteria's way of killing fungus. And uh, it's a short, saturated fatty acid. And so the, uh, the longer fatty acids of coconut oil and uh, uh, olive oil are bound to this indigestible fiber of the carrot and slowly released all the way down your intestine. And they have a, a very profound, uh, safe uh, disinfecting action on your intestine that will take care of not only the fungus, but 
a lot of bad uh, other types of organisms. Okay, good. I think we'll have to uh, have to call it uh, call it a night there. So make sure that people get your uh, contact information, Doctor Pete. Uh, well, thank you so much for all the callers who have uh, phoned in this week, and um, thank you so much for listening to the show. Um, for those who uh, would like to find out more about Doctor Ray Pete, his website is www.raypeat.org. No, dot com. Sorry, dot com. Now it's dot com. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Gosh, I get that wrong so often. It's dot com. Okay, so raypeat dot com. R a y p e a t dot com. So I was just going to spell it out. R a y p e a t. Okay, so he's got a very informative website with a lot of uh, scholarly research articles that are all fully referenced uh, from those topics that he first introduced himself for, uh, things like salt, uh, the uh, polyunsaturated issues, uh, hormone-related issues, uh, has some articles there on cancers and their uh, and their their yeah their genesis, um, and yeah, it's a very good site, well worth looking out uh, and finding more from. Okay, so we can be reached toll free one eight 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 WBM Herb uh, for consultations or further information Monday through Friday. And thank you so much uh, to all of you who listen regularly and uh, those who tuned in this evening. To those who have ears, let them hear. Good night.